So hello everybody. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jessica, who is a certified uh, English teacher and doctoral student uh, working under the direction of uh, three people. Sarah Hatchwell at the University of Montpellier, formerly uh, here. Sylvain Bataille, who is not here today. Uh, and uh, Georges Claude. Uh, so you are in the fourth year of your doctoral dissertation, which consists of a study of the various representations of mothers and motherhoods in the American sitcoms Friends uh, from an ideological and narratological perspective. So you currently hold uh, an ATER position here in uh, Le Havre, where you teach uh, English and literature. Mm -hmm. And today you are going to uh, introduce us one of your topics. And exactly. the title yeah. is here. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Florence, for that uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, Georges Claude and Kevin, uh, for your uh, organization and uh, for your welcome. And thank you to uh, David also, uh, who is uh, across the, the, the hall. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to uh, speak today uh, about uh, uh, Friends. And we're going to, um, uh, it's going to, it's going to be directly related to uh, some of the things that I'm looking at in, uh, in, my, in my dissertation. Um, um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, maternity narratives, um, questions of uh, intersectionality, and uh, the way that they um, interact with these narratives to uh, create hierarchies of, uh, of maternities, okay? Um, so um, uh, just for a little anecdote, last week I was in uh, Montpellier and I was listening to Donna Andriol, who was speaking uh, about friends as well. She was talking about gender in friends. And afterwards, there was uh, quite an animated discussion uh, about uh, about the place of this sitcom um, and how people are interpreting it now, uh, which is one of the things that I will I will talk about um, in my paper. Um, and there seemed to be kind of a real divide, uh, perhaps a generational divide in uh, the different appreciations. So um, I I wonder if that same dynamic will uh, will be reproduced today. In any case, um, I look forward to to discussing uh, some of these things uh, afterwards and after uh, Sebastian's uh, presentation as well. Okay, um, so in the quarter century since Friends debuted on NBC, the sitcom has become a veritable televisual and cultural phenomenon, and its continued success has exposed it to increased scrutiny and criticism in what is clearly a very different uh, cultural context than the one in which it originally aired. Revealing the extent to which issues of cultural representation have become a flashpoint for commentary and controversy, and the extent to which these issues are inherently political, critics, scholars, and viewers alike have called out the sitcom for what they see as problematic representations of transgendered and fat people, amongst others, as well as sexism, homophobia, and a lack of racial and ethnic diversity more generally. So in their recent um, and comprehensive analysis of the sitcom, Simone Knox and Kai Hannah Schwind suggest that Friends has become the emblematic, problematic fave, referring to the influential and now defunct Tumblr page, Your Fave is Problematic, a site which one vice writer referred to as the woke blog that started it all. Indeed, it would be tempting to call Friends a victim of its own success if it were appropriate to attribute the status of victimhood to a multi-billion dollar multinational televisual franchise. While criticism of Friends is not new, back in 19, uh, 1995, Oprah Winfrey told the six young actors that she would like to see them get a black friend uh, before offering to buy the fictional apartment building across Monica's apartment, the sitcom's arrival on Netflix in the United States, as well as the 20th and then 25th anniversaries of the program, seemed to have sparked uh, renewed sorry, interest and criticism in this NBC classic. So in a 2017 episode of the Your Fave is Problematic podcast, for example, Friends is thoroughly dissected and found to be thoroughly problematic by the two hosts, both uh, female Gen Xers, who expressed a certain appreciation for the sitcom uh, during its original net network run. They specifically argue that Friends is really shitty to women. Uh, that's a quote. Um, while the feminist credentials of Friends can and have been questioned, the overwhelmingly negative spin on Friends given by the hosts of the Your Fave is Problematic podcast not only fails to take into consideration the televisual and generic contexts of, uh, in which Friends was originally conceived and broadcast, aspects which it seems to me are crucial to understand the sitcom, 
It also erases the many ways in which this program creates space for narratives pertaining specifically to women and to women's experiences, all while regularly attracting millions of viewers over a 10-year period, an accomplishment which cannot be taken for granted in this or any primetime network television comedy. So by insisting on a delicate narrative equilibrium for each of their six main characters, the sitcom's creators, David Crane and Marta Kaufman, who as a gay man and a woman constituted one of the more diverse creative teams uh, in the mid-90s world of the sitcom genre, ensured that the three female counterparts shared equal narrative space and screen time with their, uh, sorry, ensured that the three uh, female uh, characters uh, shared equal uh, screen time with their male counterparts. Furthermore, uh, friends didn't shy away from questions related to female sexuality and desire, topics which, it must be remembered, were far from being commonplace on network television at the time. And this is this famous scene of uh, Monica uh, describing the process of how to uh, lead a woman to orgasm to Chandler. And it's a scene that was um, actually um, shown again in The Handmaid's Tale, in the season two of The Handmaid's Tale, as a kind of a nostalgic throwback to a time, a different, you know, a different, better uh, time. Excuse me. Um, so uh, these um, narrative arcs from numerous episodes offer space for the three female protagonists to explore, express, and assume their sexuality, uh, even though this is in general uh, within a heteronormative context. Um, however, some of the most significant narratives pertaining to female experience and female bodily experience in Friends concern narratives of pregnancy and maternity. So while it may be argued that this type of narrative is inherently conservative, guilty of reinforcing an essentializing view of women as born nurturers, procreators, black with intuitive maternal skills and child rearing know-how, it is my position that while Friends does at times seem to veer towards this type of stereotypical representation, the program in general offers viewers the possibility of more nuanced interpretations of the experiences of pregnancies and motherhood. Indeed, the sitcom offers four distinct and prolonged narrative arcs which deal with maternity throughout its ten seasons. They include the story of an expectant lesbian couple, so the first of its kind on network television, uh, a narrative of uh, gestational pregnancy in season four, that was uh, uh, with Phoebe, um, the conscious decision on the part of a main character to become a single mother by choice, or a, a narrative of SMC, um, and uh, finally, a narrative of infertility, both male and female infertility, followed by a narrative of adoption in which both the birth mother and the adoptive mother's experiences are accorded screen time. So um, none of these uh, narratives are, uh, are perfect in terms of their representation. There are, they are in many ways uh, problematic. Uh, but um, this is to point out that while choosing to uh, devote narrative space to stories of pregnancy and motherhood may not be the most innovative decision in a television writer's room, uh, indeed pregnancy Pregnancy is often seen as a way to rescue or revive a flailing televisual fiction. Uh, the way that Friends chose to frame these stories as systematically falling on the margins of uh, what Samuel Chambers has described as sanguine nuptial families most certainly was quite innovative indeed, uh, again given the socio-political and institutional contexts of the time. And so just um, for those of you who may not be um, familiar with the idea, this, idea, this idea of the sanguine nuptial family is that uh, there are two kind of fundamental elements of the traditional nuclear family, um, and they are that uh, the members are biologically related, so linked by blood, and the family is anchored within the institution of, uh, of marriage. And again, none of these pregnancies in Friends that are imagined in Friends uh, leads to families that correspond entirely to this definition. Okay, so these narrative arcs offer viewers new and, in my opinion, profound ways of conceiving of and understanding the maternal role. That is to say, who do we consider mothers? How, who, how do they consider themselves? Uh, what is their specific role? Is it reduced to uh, their physiological uh, bodily processes? Is it uh, mo merely a social role? Is it some combination of both? Um, in addition, within some of the narratives themselves, a space is created to discuss what poet and feminist thinker Adrian Rich termed in the 1970s, motherhood as experience. So Rich famously posited this conception of motherhood in opposition to what she labeled motherhood as institution. And in so doing, she brought attention to the significance of a woman's lived experience of her own role and identity as a mother and as a woman who mothers. 
So examples in Friends of drawing attention to the experience of mothering are particularly numerous in the story arc of Rachel Green, for example, and they include overt discussions of the character's ambivalence concerning her transition, her imminent transition, uh, shift in identity from non-mother to maternal figure, um, they also include questions of her sexuality uh, during her sec and sexual desire during her pregnancy, um, and, and as well uh, the difficulties of the postpartum period that she encounters, including uh, problems with breastfeeding and unexplained uh, tearfulness, which is kind of a sitcom's coded way of addressing postpartum depression. Okay. Um, so by dedicating such extensive narrative space to stories of mothering and mothers-to-be and in positioning these stories on the periphery of the traditional family structure, Friends demonstrates a certain commitment, not just to women's issues and to women's bodily experiences in particular, but to a reframing or a reconsideration of the traditional family structure as a whole. Um, so I would suggest that while it is certainly possible and appropriate to interrogate the feminist politics of particular jokes, scenes, and episodes which, which figure within uh, the Friends' uh, diegetic sphere, in light of its continual and years-long approach to telling stories relevant to women, certain women, uh, as we will see, it seems a bit hasty to dismiss uh, Friends as being shitty to women. Um, so what then of arguments suggesting that Friends was insensitive to, ra to issues of racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, the debate surrounding African American representation, for example, in Friends is heated and ongoing. I'm not going to address it here in the paper, but it's something that we can uh, perhaps discuss afterwards. Um, um, however, for all its absence of diversity, Friends does at various moments distance itself, albeit slightly, from its otherwise dominant preoccupation with the white middle class. Um, hiding in plain sight, the main cast features two characters coded somewhat differently than the other four. Throughout the series, viewers are repeatedly reminded that uh, Monica, Ross, Rachel, and Chandler all share something of a common history rooted first in uh, the middle class suburbs of Long Island and later as university students. Uh, Joey Tribbiani and Phoebe Buffay are left out of this pre-diegetic sphere, their foreign-sounding last names reinforcing their characters' difference from the others. In the series' first episodes especially, Joey in particular is stereotyped as a macho Italian-American and the brother of six sisters. And in Joey's large family lies a hint not only of the character's Roman Catholic religious heritage, but also an echo of the large and desperately poor immigrant families who fled economic hardship at the turn of the century and who were among the targets of a new class of progressive social welfare workers aimed, uh, at, aiming to assimilate and Americanize uh, the newly arrived families. And so within these families, it was often the maternal figure in particular who was instructed on the latest methods of hygiene and infant and child care, as well as birth control techniques. Uh, a darker side of this history is, of course, uh, it's the relationship to uh, the eugenics movement. Um, so Joey's tie to this Italian immigrant heritage is made explicit by his two grandmothers, Noni, who doesn't speak a word of English, and is at the bottom left, and Nona, who was, quote, the sixth person to spit on Mussolini's dead body, um, he was in the middle. And uh, Joey's ethnicity is also linked to and conflated with social class and status. Unlike Rachel's father, a doctor, or Ross and Monica's father, kind of unambiguous uh, white-collar businessman, uh, sorry, an ambiguous white-collar businessman, we, we don't actually know what he does. Uh, Joey's father is a blue-collar uh, pipe fitter. He's down here on the left. Um, He's also a bit overweight and bald. Uh, and his mother, an ethnic matriarch, is a woman who brings her grown son food and stands by passively accepting her husband's rampant infidelity. And I mention that because it's something that I think, uh, it's, it's not something that we'd see, we would see the, the mothers of the other characters um, accepting. And in fact, uh, we know that's the case because we know that uh, Chandler's mother uh, famously announced uh, during a Thanksgiving that she would divorce uh, her his father when she found out that he was sleeping with the Filipino houseboy. Um, and yet this woman uh, does stand by her, her husband and it seems to me that that is some way, uh, some reflection uh, or some comment on, um, on, on class, social status, uh, ethnicity. So while Joey's ethnic Italianness becomes diluted as the series progresses, he is continually referred to as lacking such middle class accoutrements as a college education and an appreciation for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, uh, as, uh, for an example. And his rambunctious consumption of women and overactive sex drive also place him outside the norms of respectable middle class uh, sexual morality. So, 
If in spite of Joey's early characterization, the question of social class tends to be elided in Friends, and this is true particularly as the seasons go by and the six characters continue their ascension to ever more privileged upper middle class lifestyles, um, its deployment, that is to say the deployment of social class as a narrative and comedic strategy, may be observed within the context of several of the stories of maternity that I have just identified. And I will now turn my attention to one of these in particular in the hopes of demonstrating the ways in which the overlapping discourses of uh, concerning class and social status on one hand and pregnancy and maternity on the other contribute to a positioning or perhaps a repositioning of maternal figures and their pregnancies within a larger framework of social hierarchies. So the one with Monica's boots is the 10th episode from Friends' most popular eighth season, and it takes place at the heart of Rachel's single mother by choice pregnancy narrative. At this point in the narrative, Rachel has explicitly decided to raise the child as a single mother, having handily rejected Ross's assumption that they get married, uh, and I quote, because it's the right thing to do. Joey's youngest sister, Dina, a character who the audience has never met before, shows up and reveals to Rachel that she, too, is pregnant, out of wedlock, and too afraid to tell her older brother the truth. So the episode constructs the situations of these two women as parallel. Both women are pregnant and unmarried with no particular desire uh, to marry the, the biological fathers of the fetuses they are carrying. However, while a parallel is drawn between the two women, their stories are hardly identical, and the difference in Friends' treatment of the two expectant women is quite striking. So Rachel eventually helps the younger woman confront Joey and tell him the truth about her pregnancy, and the following scenes pick up uh, after this moment of truth. So here, Joey knows uh, what is going on, and we get to kind of uh, start these. There's actually two scenes that are kind of uh, edited together, uh, and we'll see what happens at this moment if it works. Do you ever worry that you'll be walking and your baby will just like slip out? <laughs> what college was that, Dina? <laughs> oh my God, Bobby. Hi, Dina. Good to see you. Joey, what are you doing? Just what needs to be done. Dearly beloved. <laughs> oh, Joey, this is crazy. Don't interrupt me when I'm talking to God. <laughs> now, where were we? All right, okay. Do you, Dina, take this man? No. Oh, you'll take him. No, I won't. Hey, you don't get a say in this. Yes, I do. Ah, I heard I do. We're halfway there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Joey, that is enough. Listen, as beautiful and moving as this ceremony is, this is not legal. Okay? They, they don't have a marriage license. They don't have any witnesses. And the groom only has on one shoe. Yeah, he took the other one off and hit me with it. <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to realize that they are adults and that they can make their own decisions. No, they can't. They were stupid enough to get knocked up. Hey! <laughs> Contraceptives are not always effective, right? Yeah, we kind of didn't use any. Oh, come on, kids, a little help here. <laughs> Joey, just because they're not getting married doesn't mean that this is going to be a disaster. Maybe they have a plan. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, let's hear their plan. Now, what's the future look like for Dean and Bobby? Well, I really have high hopes for my band. <laughs> you were right. He is funny. Hey, now, wait a minute. I bet when you told people at first that you wanted to be an actor, they laughed at you. Well, come on, Bobby, why don't you tell us a little bit about your band? Well, it's just me and my pal, Rooster. The band's name is Num Nuts. <laughs> really? <laughs> Dina, if you're having a baby, you should be married. Even if it is to Bobby. Dude, that's not a compliment. <laughs> no, Joey, I knew you wouldn't be supportive. So what, what, what? What are you gonna do? You're gonna have the baby and, and raise it by yourself? Without a husband? You can't be a single mother alone. You're gonna ruin your life. Oh, excuse me. Am I ruining my life? No, 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 it's different for you. You're, you're so strong and together. You're not some dumb kid who doesn't know what she's doing. Excuse me? One pregnant woman at a time, please. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop there. So uh, so these two scenes very explicitly foreground. Um, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, sorry. 
There we go, okay. So these two scenes very explicitly foreground the differences between the two unmarried pregnant women. In the, uh, in the very first shot, this one that we're looking at, a subtle clue lays the groundwork for this difference in treatment, and it is rooted in questions of education, economic privilege, as well as social class and status more widely. So the two women are reading pregnancy books. So far, so good. In doing so, they are depicted as adhering to aspects of intensive mothering ideology, as theorized by Sharon Hayes in her influential work, The Cultural Contradictions of Motherhood. And so this intensive mothering ideology uh, posits that socially appropriate mothering uh, imposes a number of constricting behaviors on women as mothers, and one of those behaviors is the uh, prolific consumption of advice books by so-called uh, experts. Uh, so Dina, however, is reading Pregnancy for Dummies, a pregnancy book targeted at a general reading public. Rachel, on the other hand, is reading the more exclusive Girlfriend's Guide to Pregnancy, written by Vicki Iovine, a former fashion model and the ex-wife of music mogul Jimmy Iovine, founder of Interscope Records, which is to say a woman of immense wealth and uh, privilege. Um, and so the Girlfriend's Guides, uh, originally published in 1995, are targeted at a far more affluent public represented here by Rachel, who is by this point in the series a high-powered executive in the fashion industry working for the upscale clothing retailer Ralph Lauren. So uh, Vicki Iovine's other books include The Girlfriend's Guide to Getting Your Groove Back, A Mother's First uh, uh, Guide to the First Year of Pregnancy, and A Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce. Um, I don't know. Uh, so Dina's inferior social status and, so and class, social and class status uh, is in this scene uh, repeatedly coded as a lack of intelligence. First, thanks to the book, she's positioned as a dummy, somebody lacking even the most basic information about her own body and its biological processes. Secondly, by her question to Rachel concerning the possibility of the fetus slipping out, uh, which is met with a withering look by Rachel and laughter on the part of the studio audience. And finally, in Rachel's overt questioning of the quality of Dina's college education. Remember, she says, what college was that? that you went to. Um, and so in a previous scene, uh, Joey had kind of proudly stated that Dina had taken the SATs, uh, which is significant in the fact that she was the only member of her family to take them. We don't know what marks she got on that, on that exam. Um, and that she had also attended uh, college, that is to say all two years of it, right? That was Joey's comment, uh, which is a reference to the fact that Dina was in some sort of um, uh, place of higher education, but one of relatively low status uh, in the hierarchy of the American university system. So furthermore, Dina's strong New York accent, which at times seems even stronger than her own brother's, uh, powerfully codes her as ethnically other, while her clothes, compared to the elegant black sleekness of Rachel's outfit, code her as tacky and lacking in good taste. Her boyfriend Bobby, on the other hand, uh, is portrayed as a leather jacket wearing loser who cannot be recuperated into a more middle class sensibility in spite of Rachel's best efforts to try and open the doors for him. Um, so throughout the scenes, uh, Rachel's attempts to act as a mediator continually fall flat and are this repeatedly the source of humor. More importantly, the explicit juxtaposition of Dina's and Rachel's similar yet different situations position Rachel's single mother by choice narrative at a very different level in the social hierarchy of pregnancy and maternity. Rachel's story in, in its opposition to Dina's takes on a dimension of female empowerment and self-determination. Where Rachel is strong, oh, sorry, I could move to that one. Rachel is strong and together, and in no way ruining her life, as Joey has uh, implied. Dina is young and stupid, and Joey's use of the word "dumb" here when he talks about his sister echoes the reading material, the the Pregnancy for Dummies book that she was reading. Where Rachel's pregnancy uh, was an innocent accident, uh, the result of faulty contraception, but the use of but they used contraception nonetheless. Uh, Dina was too irresponsible to use any at all, suggesting an ominous lack of control and echoing stereotypes of the sexually deviant uh, and therefore maternally unfit uh, young minority women. Um, Rachel's economic and social status protects her from the sort of condemnation and laughter the younger, socially inferior, poorly educated mother-to-be is exposed to. And while the scenes also poke fun at Joey's outrageously conservative reaction, including his retrospectively kind of unfunny attempt to force his youngest uh, sibling into marriage against her will, um, the episode successfully constructed, uh, constructs parallel narratives of maternity in which one woman's unplanned pregnancy is the source of humor, while the others, in spite of also refusing to conform to the same societal and institutional norms is elevated to a reassuring respectability and indeed becomes the subject of celebration for an entire season. So in this juxtaposition of maternity narratives, in the elevation of certain women's stories at the expense of and laughter at others, we may identify something of a Foucauldian disciplinary system at work in this episode. Uh, in Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, Foucault writes that disciplinary apparatuses hierarchize good and bad subjects in relation to one another. 
And he adds that the differentiation is not one of acts, but of individuals themselves, of their nature, their potentialities, of their level, or their value. So rather than judging individuals as either simply good or simply bad within Foucault's system of discipline, uh, individuals are rather positioned in relation to each other on a spectrum of good to bad, better to worse, best to worst. These systems inherently then rely on others, on an other, to create meaning. And as such, the stereotyped minor character of mother-to-be Dina serves as a measure against which one may read and understand the character of mother-to-be Rachel, and thereby guiding audience interpretation of Rachel's own out-of-wedlock pregnancy. So just to finish, I would like to add a couple of elements to contextualize uh, Rachel's single mother by choice pregnancy and the excitement and enthusiasm with which American audiences responded to it. And I remind you that in the episode where uh, Rachel gives birth, um, there were 35 million viewers um, who tuned in to watch that uh, episode. So it seems to me important to consider that this reaction stands in stark contrast to the prolonged and rancorous national debate about television representation and so-called family values in the wake of a very similar narrative of single motherhood by choice occurring less than 10 years earlier in another popular situation comedy, Murphy Brown. So in 1992, and in the context of the ideologically char charged culture wars of the late 20th century, as well as a presidential campaign, Murphy's single motherhood became a flashpoint of controversy and was pointed to by none other than then Vice President Dan Quayle as an example of irresponsible representation in popular culture. That Rachel's very similar narrative in Friends was met with no such controversy suggests a significant change in cultural norms, no doubt, but also perhaps a savvier approach to presenting this type of otherwise perhaps controversial fare to a general televisual viewing audience. And so while I do not contend that Dina's brief appearance in which she is constructed as a less appropriate maternal figure was a conscious decision on the part of writers to buffer the main character's own uh, narrative from criticism, I do suggest that Dina's short narrative may serve as a sort of unconscious comfort uh, to those viewers who might otherwise have been uncomfortable with Rachel's decision to have her child out of wedlock. Dina's low-class, sexually irresponsible, but otherwise identical version of Rachel's own story serves to legitimize single motherhood as a worthy and even empowering endeavor for certain women, in this case, independent white professional women, who have the economic resources to provide for their offspring and who are in no danger of eventually asking for government handouts, for example. So those women who are, as Joey suggests, strong and together, not needy and dependent. In doing so, this episode configures the junction of whiteness and middle or upper middle classness as a, an appropriate framework for out of wedlock pregnancy and childbearing, which in turn moves this type of motherhood away from the pariah status it had occupied throughout much of the 20th century and before and becomes a new site of white upper middle class female privilege. And Finally, uh, this process of hierarchizing uh, fictional stories of motherhood, of sorting them into worthy and unworthy, of distinguishing between better and worse maternal subjects, best and worst potential mothers, takes on a particular resonance when we consider the immediate context of this episode. Uh, the One with Monica's Boots aired on December 6, 2001, less than three months after September 11th, sparked an intense period of soul searching and patriotic fervor. Uh, so Donna Andriol has written that the narrative arc of Rachel's pregnancy seems to want, and I'm quoting her here, seems to want to compensate for the grief of a nation. So as such, Rachel's pregnancy and the fetus she carries become invested with hope and renewal and above all become symbols of innocence in the face of unspeakable and foreign evil. So in this context, the situation, com the situation comedy's representation of Rachel's incipient motherhood is particularly rife with meaning. America will be best preserved by her strongest and most together mothers, those women who have the necessary resources, education, class, and desirable ethnicity, that is to say whiteness, to appropriately raise future generations of children. And the obsession with marital status may be safely seen as unimportant, perhaps even old-fashioned, thanks to this episode's reinvestment of white middle-class women as America's most desirable mothers. So, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>